Bridging Gaps, the business podcast with Deborah Levitt, sharing the challenges and stories of fellow business owners. Hello and welcome. Today I have Holly Wagner with me. Holly is a video marketer and while her story in terms of her business itself is very interesting, the other aspect that I think is really inspirational is the fact that Holly is 25 and she's been running her own business since leaving university. So I'm really looking forward to talking to her more about that experience and sharing with us some of the challenges and the successes that she's had since leaving university. Hi Holly, how are you? Hi Deborah, I'm great, thank you. How are you? I am very well, thank you very much, and really pleased to have you on today. Thanks for having me, looking forward to it. Uh, me too. Um, so Holly, you run Green Kiwi Productions, and as I mentioned in the introduction, it's something that you set up out of university. So do you want to start off just by telling us what it is that Green Kiwi Productions does? Sure, yeah. So I work with uh, small business owners to create video marketing for them that gets results. So rather than just having like a pretty video that looks nice on their website, it actually leads their prospects into following their course action, uh, getting in touch with them, and most importantly, makes them um, make some money and helps them to reach more of their ideal clients. And, and how do you help them to do that? I know that you've mentioned elsewhere that you have a formula that, that helps to, to get people those leads. Yeah, so a lot of people make the mistake in, in all their marketing, not just video marketing, of talking about themselves and um, just kind of talking about what they've done and maybe talking about past experiences and qualifications when actually the client or the or prospect wants to know how you can help them and how you're going to solve their issue. So we really come at it from an angle of rather than, as I say, rather than talking about themselves, we get them to what well, I would get them to put together some marketing headlines that really ask questions that are in their ideal client's head um, and from there we then go on to showing testimonials from existing clients and at the end we always always follow a call to action just because if you don't have one at the end people are just gonna forget about your video life will get in the way and they'll never get in contact whereas if you tell them exactly what they need to do in order to get in touch with you they're far more likely to do it so all of my videos kind of follow that format to ensure that you're always going to, you know, you've, you've increased your chances of that, that prospect getting in touch with you and hopefully booking. And, and do you find that most people, you know, when you ask them to come up with some of those questions, do they understand their, their market and what people are likely to be asking when they are trying to find, you know, that particular business? And to be honest, most of them not to begin with. Um, a lot of people try to use language that kind of sounds uh, really advanced and because and they want to sound like they're the expert when actually your your prospects and your ideal clients probably that kind of language doesn't resonate with them so really kind of bring it back down to basics and we use marketing headlines that are so so simple so for example I work in a, with a lot of clients in the health and well-being industry so for them their kind of questions are do you hate the gym do you wish you could lose weight and feel better? You know, rather than using kind of loads of gym speak and using all this clear language, we really bring it down to simplify it so that your ideal clients are going to resonate with what you're saying. Yeah, and, and I can see how that works because I know for myself when I came out of, you know, the corporate environment, there's almost a feel that you still need to have that that speak and to sound as you say, like an expert or something, rather than speaking to somebody as just another person and somebody that you might like to have a chat with. So I can see why bringing that down to the simple levels would really work. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, even myself, when I started, you know, I'd use language like 4K, 1080 HD, mentioning my camera and my qualification. You know, no one cares about that. They just want to know how I can help their business to get more clients and target more of their ideal client. And, you know, most importantly, make more money because that's, you know, what why we're in business. We love what we do. And of course, we want to profit from it. So really, that's kind of what it what it comes down to. So when you started, Holly, did you start off by doing video marketing or what was your path to getting to, to what you offer today? Well, before I started my business or since setting up? Uh, since setting up. Um, to begin with, I used to, I would do anything video related. So I used to do weddings and um, I used to do event coverage, any, anything and everything video. But 
I kind of realized that I really loved working with small business owners to create marketing for them that, that kind of got results and would last in the lifetime of their business. So just kind of through process of elimination, I guess, more than anything, I realized who my who I loved working with and kind of how I could help them. And gradually I just cut it down. So I stopped doing events and stopped doing weddings. And, you know, I've really gone quite niche to, to the point where I'm targeting, um, as I said earlier, people in the health and wellness industry. So it really has niched down right to, to such a specific target market. But for me, I just think they're the people I love working with. And I just discovered it through working with different clients. And kind of that's how I've got to, you know, where I am today, really. And did you find when you started off, were people, so, so having started off, because you must have been, what, 22 at the time when you started your business? Yeah, yeah, it was, that's right, just over three years ago. So, so were people, did they kind of think, oh, well, she's just at a university and, you know, she'll be cheap and we can get, you know, a good deal, we're doing her a favor? Or how did they relate to you at that early, you know, starting point of your business? I think, to be honest, when I started, I didn't really know what I was doing. And my initial um, marketing tactic was to be the cheapest. So I obviously didn't do myself any favours there. <laughs> but, you know, when you start out, you've got no idea what you're doing. You know, nobody does. Um, so, so yeah, I, I kind of brought that on myself, to be honest. I was trying to kind of undercut competitors. And, and it got me my first few clients. So, you know, I do think it's a complete learning curve and it was worth doing. But... I, I don't think that people, I don't think my age really necessarily stopped people from working with me. I just think, um, I think a lot of people were kind of willing to give me a chance because when I spoke to my first few clients, I was very honest and just said, look, I've, I've just come out of uni, I'm setting up and um, I'm more than happy to do you a deal, you know, for the first few clients. And I just sort of built it up from there. But whether that was the right approach, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I mean, it worked to begin with. As I say, it worked. So it's got to have been the right approach. <laughs> true and how did it feel you know so coming out of university did you initially did you always know that you were going to set up your own business or were you assuming that you would go out get a job um and you know wherever that would take you or you know what were your expectations while I was at uni I just I I really wasn't sure kind of what I wanted to do when I came out and I I went to the University of Lincoln and I actually stayed there for an extra six months after just because I didn't want to be a grown up and and get a proper job you know as it were and I was sort of applying I really remember applying to all of these media jobs and that just it was such a daunting task and all of them were where you would start off as a runner you'd be on really really terrible money you'd be working ridiculous hours and it was kind of like you would have to work for years and years and years and kind of hope that you might maybe move, you know, meet someone who's higher up and gives you a chance and kind of progress slowly. Whereas I didn't want someone else to tell me, you know, what, what they were going to pay me, what they thought I was worth, what hours I was going to work. I just hated that kind of hierarchy of, you know, the the people at the bottom working so hard to people above them. So I wasn't sure that I was, going to run a business I'm sure what I didn't want and what I didn't want was to be working for you you know terrible money and sort of starting again from the bottom so I guess the natural kind of answer to to my problems and what I didn't want to do was to you know work for myself and and how did you come to make that decision um I actually went to uh it was an event at at university it was kind of people that didn't really know what they wanted to do so I was very much their ideal client um, and I went along and I just met, I met a few people there who had set up businesses and they were just I think there's this kind of preconception that people who run businesses are you know older men in BMWs but in suits you know you don't kind of realize that that people that are just like you uh, do run their own businesses so it kind of opened my eyes and from there I met someone from the Prince's Trust and who, who eventually gave me my business loan and ended up doing their program so it really was just a case of meeting other people and realizing that you know it is achievable and it is doable and did you find it you know when you went down that route were you feeling you know was it scary was it exciting was it some mix of all of those things were you worried about how you were going to you know survive and pay bills or you know what what was it feeling like 
Yeah, complete mixed bag, actually. I mean, it kind of felt right in my gut. It felt like the right decision. But naturally, my, my brain was kind of, you know, going through all those doubts and, you know, sure you can do it, think of all the work. But because I was going from a poor university student, going to a poor business startup wasn't really a big jump for me. <laughs> it made it a lot less scary. <laughs> it was a fairly smooth yeah, well, transition. <laughs> exactly that and I think I think excitement was the thing overall but of course there's always going to be worries and stuff but yeah it felt right and with the Princess Trust so so I actually do some e-mentoring for the Princess Trust um, which I've just started fairly recently so I know that they're working both with people looking for jobs and also starting up businesses how do you feel that that apart from the financial aspects of it how do you feel that that supported you in getting your business up and running oh they were brilliant I remember I think it was like a four day four or five day initial course that you go on and they teach you all about taxes and all the important stuff that schools should be teaching you but don't Um, and then going on from there just the whole experience of pitching to a panel and the fact that you get a a business mentor I think I had mine for two years um it's constant support and like I said earlier you've got no idea what you're doing you know you everybody needs that guidance who's gone down that route so just having someone that you can ask questions to and someone that holds you accountable was was definitely you know what kind of built the foundation of my business and I've got you know I I owe them a lot for you know how how I operate today because I still remember all the stuff they taught me and yeah they're, they're brilliant Oh, that, that's excellent. And <laughs> well, it's really nice to hear how they are helping people. As I said, it's fairly early days for me being involved. So I haven't really seen anybody through to, to really make a, a big change as yet. They're, they're just starting out. Oh, wow. Well, you will see them, definitely. There's loads of people that were really successful from it. So I'm sure you'll get to meet a few yourself. I'm looking forward to it. So Holly, when you started, so so you've gone through that transition of, you know, I no longer want to do events or weddings, and you're starting to identify that that niche of small business owners. How are you now finding your clients and and what are you doing to, I guess, establish contacts and, and keep new clients coming in? Yeah, so I you I do a lot of networking um, at the moment, which works really well for me. Particularly the ones that are like a membership one, so you see the same people kind of every week or every month. They work well because you you tend to build up relationships with people rather than the ones that you drop in. You don't necessarily get to know people that well, um, so that's a real big um, source of of clients for me. And um, I also use Facebook marketing, which works quite well and. In terms of getting old clients back, this was always something that was quite tricky for me just because with a promotional video, you know, you don't, you tend to do one and that's it. You know, you might do a refreshed one in a few years or so, but I found that actually introducing other video services like testimonial filming and content video for social media, doing things like that works really well. And it just means I get to work with the same clients again and again, which is, you know, what I love. I love working with them. And I think we've already built up that relationship. So it's much easier to work with them again because, you know, they've already trust me and they've, they've already seen what I can do for them. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's that tends to be my main kind of sources of, of clients. Well, and, and around the networking, I know a lot of people I've spoken to find networking can be quite daunting. So, you know, the first time you're going into a room or you're, you're you know, speaking to people you haven't spoken to before. And how did you find it? Oh, the first one was horrific. I mean, it was such a great meeting with the best people, but I remember going in and I was so, so nervous. And normally, as you'll know, when you go networking, you get an opportunity to kind of stand up and talk about your business for a minute. And I think I just stood up, said my name and mentioned something about video and kind of sat back down. And I was my heart was racing and it was just such a scary experience. But, you know, that... As soon as I'd done that first one, I I absolutely loved it. You know, I I started doing loads more in my area. And it's just it's just a confidence thing. And the people that you meet are so, so welcoming. And there's there's, there is no reason to be scared. It's just, you know, it's out of your comfort zone when you begin. So that's why your initial one's scary. But that people are so, so kind and they're always so supportive of what you do. And it really kind of helped build my confidence with public speaking and just going into meetings. So, so now I don't think anything of it. But yeah, that, that first one I remember was terrifying. 
Well, and I know because I've joined one of the groups that you used to belong to before you moved to to uh, Swindon, and I know that everybody, you know, when I mention you, and you know, saying you know that we're meeting to interview and that everybody is just so. Well, they're kind of sad, actually. It's like, oh, Holly, she's lovely, and she's moved. <laughs> oh, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's very nice. So you're obviously made an impact on, on the group there. When you... I miss them so much, but I'm still a part of the scene. I'm, I'm part of the one in Swindon now. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely, but I do miss them all. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not surprised, and they, they are a lovely group, and, and it's nice that you've got the, the group now to get to know in Swindon as well. Yeah, that? definitely. So when you're working with people, I know somebody, um, she's a photographer, and one of the things that she deals with is that a lot of people are, I, I don't know about men so much, but particularly women, are really uncomfortable seeing themselves, you know, with pictures um, you know, photos being taken of them. Do you find that that's true and possibly even more so with people being on video? Oh, 100%. And I actually specialise in working with women who are camera shy. So I hear it all the time. Like, oh, I'm useless on camera. I've tried and I'm rubbish. And the fact is, if you can have a conversation with one person, you can you can be on the film. You know, it's just it's just that kind of fear that, that people really struggle with. And what when I film with people, it's always all the kind of pre-preparation work is done so they really know what they're going to say. And I work with them on the day just to make sure that, just to kind of make sure they're comfortable and to give them tips on kind of how to present and how to talk to a camera because it's not natural talking into a lens. <laughs> you know, it's really not and it never is going to be. But the more you practice and when you've got someone else to kind of bounce ideas off, it becomes so much easier. And what I always say to people is, look, your first take is going to be terrible because, um, you know, most people's are. But once you kind of get into it and we get into the swing of things, you'll just completely relax. And it's not like I show up with a big camera crew, you know, it is just me a camera <laughs> in the person. So it's, it's as easy as it possibly can be. And I'm, I'm yet to find someone I can't work with. So um, <laughs> hopefully it stays that way. So you're there to make them feel warm and give them confidence. Yeah, exactly that. You know, and I totally get it. And I once sort of didn't really get what the fuss was about. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to film myself. And I totally got it. Like I was nervous and I was kind of stumbling over my words and stuff. So it made me really understand. It, it kind of helped me to get into their mindset a little bit. But it's one of those things, you know, that no one enjoys doing it. You know, I've never worked with someone who's so excited to be on film. But it's one of those, it's like anything with your business. You know, sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone in order to, to you know, grow and, and get more clients, really. And that's something which I think takes a lot of people by surprise because they, they they get into business or they start up a business because they're good at something. So, you know, you were good at media and, you know, somebody else is good at photography or, you know, whatever else they are. And, and then they discover all of those other things that they need to do, which do take them out of their comfort zone and don't necessarily play to their strengths. So it can be really challenging. Oh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. But I think what's important is to delegate the stuff you're not good at. You know, you're, you're, like, like you said, you're, you're good at what you do, which is why you set up a business, but you're not going to be good at all aspects of it. So get other people into your business who are good at that and pass it on to them because, you know, you people are kind of quick to, they don't want to spend money on things like that and they don't want to spend money on a videographer, but actually the time that you're spending doing something you're not enjoying, you know, time's the only thing you're not going to get back. You can always make more money, but, you know, I, I don't want my time wasted. So that's, you know, I think delegating is the, the way forward. It, yeah, absolutely. And, and as you say, there's kind of that point where you can't necessarily justify the spend, but it, it's making sure that you can as soon as possible that you do justify it because the results that you'll get are one, as you say, your time Two, just the quality is generally so much higher than, you know, what you would do yourself. So, so for example, a couple of years ago, I decided um, I had been doing um, as a, as a sideline, I was doing some design work of textile design and I'd had various cushions and things made up and, and I was looking at them and, um, I'm a reasonable photographer. So, so, you know, I've had, you know, people like my photos, things like that. So I thought, oh, I can do this myself. 
<laughs> and then I started taking pictures of them and realized that what I take pictures of is landscapes. And I'm quite good at landscapes. I'm no good whatsoever at products. Um, and so I hired somebody to do them and just the quality and the difference, it, you know, it was money well spent. It was so much better than anything I would have been able to produce myself. That's exactly it. You know, it's, it's kind of, people get stuck in that vicious cycle of I can't afford the help. So I'll do it all myself. So I run out of time. So I can't spend time doing what I love, you know, and until you break that cycle, you'll, you'll never kind of grow and you'll never be able to, to kind of get to the next level. I don't think. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things that when I work with people is sometimes looking at going, well, actually, that does need to be done. And so that should be one of the first things that you delegate. So again, as soon as you can, delegate that piece so that it's off your plate and you can start focusing on the, the other elements. But it, it's hard because when you're worrying about money coming in, um, you do worry about the money going out and, and you don't necessarily have that confidence or belief in yourself that you can make more money. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I've been stuck in that cycle so many times. And, you know, I invested in a, a, co a business coach last year, and it was terrifying. It was a huge amount of money. But I just it, it kind of felt right, you know, and I just had to trust that it was meant to be and that I would I would get my investment back and everything. And, and it did pay off, you know, it's been brilliant. But I totally get that that fear zone, you know, so it's never going to feel easy ever. <laughs> So when you're working with people and they start to come back to you, so they've done that initial video and then they're looking for some of those, you know, other content videos, the other services that you're now offering, do you find a difference? Do you see them growing and becoming more comfortable and proficient in front of the camera? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think they've always kind of got those fears still. And they've always, I think, again, the first take is never going to be as good as the rest of them. But I can definitely see a big difference. And I think with video, before you've worked with a videographer, it's that that kind of unknown element. You know, you don't really know what to expect. But the fact that we've already worked together, they kind of know the setup. They know what's coming up. So I think it just takes away that whole element of surprise. And, and yeah, they definitely always seem a lot more comfortable and a lot more confident. So if you were going to, so, so if somebody had decided not to hire you, Holly, and they've decided to do their own video, what tips would you give them? So if they're just going to, you know, do something fairly simple, you know, maybe just sitting in front of camera, are there any key tips that you could say, you know, le at least consider these things? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the most important one is face your light source. So if, I mean, natural lighting um, or ambient lighting is the most flattering. So if you can film your videos in the day facing uh, a window or do them outside, that will really improve your videos. Um, and also just practicing is, is always a good idea and making sure that you're looking into your camera on your phone or on your tablet, whatever you film on, because people will feel like they're having a conversation with you and it kind of, you know, builds up that rapport with them. If you're looking all around the room, they're kind of not necessarily uh, engaging <laughs> with you. And, um, just keeping it still as well, if you can, if you can invest in one of those you get little tripods on eBay for about five pounds that hold your phone and keeping it still will also really kind of help build that engagement factor because when you're walking around with your phone, you tend to make your viewers feel a little bit seasick. So keep it stable, um, face the light source and just keep practicing and your videos will get better and better. Excellent. Thank you. And I know that, you know, the videos where people are walking around, I hate those. <laughs> It's just, uh, you know, when, as you say, they're holding their phone and they're talking to you and everything's shaking. And I think, I just don't want to look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, Holly, some of the other things that, you know, we talked about before um, and in some of the information you sent me is that you are looking to try and create a workspace for other creatives and trying to put together a small team for you know as you move forward do you do you want to talk about that a little bit yeah sure well I mean I'm I'm all my time is being kind of consumed by editing at the moment I'm doing quite a few courses for people like online digital courses as opposed to promos so I'm spending so much time doing that and I thought 
you know, as much as I love editing, I don't want to be doing it every day. So the kind of answer to that is to take on um, like a junior editor and um, someone that I can kind of show them how I like to work um, and kind of just just kind of mold them into into what my business is about, you know, and kind of help them to, to grow and get more confident in, in editing. And I just think you know, I, I don't, I always hated when I was younger that, that hierarchy of working, um, you know, when I've worked in pubs and in retail and stuff, and you kind of start off from the bottom and you've got someone above you who's telling you what to do and someone above them, you know, I never want to kind of create that environment. I want people, that anyone that comes into my business, I want them to feel like it's theirs as well. And I want them to kind of see us as, as equals rather than see me as a boss telling you what to do. You know, I want them to kind of be able to say, right, I want to work these hours and, this is what I what I'm worth, you know, and kind of go at it from that angle. Because I think if you've got someone who's happy working with you, they're gonna they're gonna want to stay with you, you know. And I think businesses that have got such high um, staff turnover, it's because they're not happy, you know. So I, I'm I'm really keen to kind of create a space for people where they can feel like they're a part of the team and they can feel like it's it's their business as well as mine. And and what types of things are you doing in terms of the space itself, or is the space more of a mental space? Um, in terms of how they feel and how empowered they feel. I'm sorry, say that last bit again. Sorry, is it more of a mental space in terms of how they feel generally and how empowered they feel? Yeah, yeah, I I guess I want them to, I mean, the reason I want to take on an an editor specifically is because there's someone who's going to be really passionate about video and they're probably someone that found um, editing through their love of video you know they probably did it as a hobby before because that's how a lot of editors come about so I guess it is more of a mental thing yeah I just I want to create an environment where people are are doing what they love doing um, and they don't feel like they've got to you know work for someone they don't like working hours they don't enjoy and, and all that so yeah I guess it's probably more of a mental space than, than physical. And, and how do you think you would deal with the situation um, if it arose where somebody maybe wasn't pulling their weight or where you know things weren't working out and you did need to step into that boss role so so your your goal of of being equal and and fair and, and equally valued wasn't necessarily working how would you feel if that arose yeah, I mean, it's tricky. I guess it's all about balance for me. I know I, I, you can't kind of be everyone's best friend all the time and you're always <laughs> going to be in situations where you've got to uh, play that boss role. And I think probably, I mean, where I've I've witnessed it be done wrong in the past is when I've worked for companies and they just kind of talk at you and talk down to you and say, this is what you've done wrong. Um, and it's not, you know, it kind of, it, does, it creates an angry environment. I think actually if you just talk to people and kind of, explain what your concerns are and and kind of speak to them and say what are your concerns you know and and just kind of be really honest and and not kind of aggressive with it is probably the way forward I mean you're you know there's always going to be people that don't pull their weight and are lazy and I just think I wouldn't ever let my business suffer you know if I had to get rid of someone that then that's the case but I think just making sure you actually talk with people and, and check they're happy and you know get them to give their input as well and I think just being approachable to people is probably going to help eliminate those people that you know aren't pulling their way and it just yeah creates a better environment for everyone. And I think you're right speaking to people and having a discussion with them it is always going to be much more productive than speaking at them and and just dictating exactly yeah. what they do and and i think sometimes people who have maybe found it difficult in other environments can really flourish in something where they are being given that respect and they are given you know the opportunity to speak and to to feel that they're inputting to the way things are done definitely yeah no i, I completely agree with you and i've only come to realize that through having jobs in the past where you know where they do just talk at you and they do tell you what you're doing wrong and it just doesn't work you know why would it work so I'm all about you know motivating people and making sure that that they're happy and that they're listened to because you know if if you don't have happy employees you're not going to have a happy business you know and you're going to find it hard to get happy clients so it's kind of a win-win situation really it is and and where do you want the business to go generally if you look further ahead do you see yourself having you know a team of video marketers or do you see it as still always being yourself with maybe just a few more people supporting you 
Yeah, I think probably the latter. Just, I mean, when I first started, I had these visions of having like massive buildings, big headquarters in London. And I wanted to, you know, go get massive and and uh, serve really massive companies and huge clients. But actually, as I've been going for the few years that I have, I've kind of realised that I like being quite a small business because I think it's more approachable to other small businesses to work with a business that's similar to theirs. And I definitely want to branch out and, and get kind of support with extra editing and extra camera people, like I mentioned earlier, but I never want to have, well, at the moment, I never <laughs> want to have, um, you know, a huge team and a huge headquarters. It's just, it's not really me. I quite like the, you know, the kind of small business lifestyle that I've got at the moment. So keeping it personal still with your business and anybody that you bring into your business. I think so. Yeah, I think sometimes companies can kind of lose the, their personality a little bit when they go really big. You know, and it all becomes all corporate and not all of them at all. But, you know, that's not what I want. I do want to kind of keep it personal and small. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at at the moment. I just want to help more business owners. So I guess just kind of keep going in the direction that I'm going in, hopefully take on some people and, and yeah, kind of let it grow naturally, I guess. That sounds excellent. And I think you're right about when they become bigger as corporates, I think it's quite difficult to maintain that, that personal touch because they're, well, they just get big and you don't necessarily know everybody. So the companies that do manage it, I think are really impressive, but, but I think it is a very difficult balancing act. Yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. And I I think the same for a lot of my clients as well, you know, when they when we're kind of putting together some marketing to go in their videos, they they want to use all these big words and sound really corporate. And I say, well, that's not you. You know, you're a small business. And the advantage that you have over big businesses is the fact that you can be personal. You know, you can send your clients birthday cards and just little things like that, that kind of that people love, you know, that that real personal aspect. And, and I think that's why video works so well for small business owners, because you get to kind of and engage with your your clients and your prospects all the time you get to really build up that rapport and feel like that build up that no like and trust factor and it just feels like they know you personally and that is so true i think everything that i've you know seen and heard over the past couple of years it is all about that it's about you and and what you bring and that some people are going to work with you because they like you some people aren't going to work with you because they don't like you and that's fine because you don't want to work with the people who don't like you because you probably don't like them either exactly that and I, I remember when I first started out being heartbroken if I lost a, a you know prospect and I would be I think you know I'd spend to spend sleepless nights thinking you know why do they not want to work with me when it's fine you know you're never going to work with everyone and I think the right people will will come to you you know as long as you're specific in your marketing about who you want to work with you've just got to know that you know like you say not everyone's right for you and the ones that are right are the ones you want to work with so don't worry either way <laughs> And with you, with the people that you're working with, so once you've got them, you know, they're now thinking in their marketing headlines, they've done the video, they've overcome their, well, to some degree, their concern about being in front of the camera. Once you've completed that video for them, do you provide any support or help them to, to actually market it, to actually, you know, get it seen by other people? Yeah, well, I always say as part of all my packages, I always include support, you know, once your your video is made, I don't just kind of make it and leave them to it, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in web design or anything like that, but I've certainly got experience uploading to YouTube and Facebook and that sort of thing. So, you know, all my clients, I always say to them, look, if you get stuck, just drop me an email, give me a call, and I'll always guide you as best I can or send you in the direction of someone who I, I know can help you. Um, because you know I, I, I want them to be able to use their video I want them to to kind of get it out there I don't just want to you know I don't want to sort of cut off all ties with them as soon as it's done so it's really great for me actually to hear how it's doing and I, I do get in touch with them and just say you know um, in, in say a few months after we filmed you know, how did you find it and how many clients have you have you got as a result and it's that's the most rewarding part for me is kind of hearing uh, how well their video is done and how many clients they've got as a result of it. So it's actually not just the act of doing the video, but really seeing them gain the benefit from it, which which gives you the buzz. Exactly that. Yeah, you know, I don't, 
I, I only sort of try to work with one client a week actually just because it, it means I can really work with them um, and, and kind of really find out how they're doing rather than getting loads of people through the door and kind of not finding out what happens. You know, I really like that, that kind of um, aspect of it, of, of getting to know how it worked for them. And, you know, it, it's learning for me as well. You know, when I hear how their video is doing, it always gives me more ideas and it allows me to help future people. So it's, you know, it works both ways. And do you find, do you have much of a community of other videographers that you work with or I don't mean work with, but that you're associated with that you share ideas off or do you find that you tend to, to not be in that kind of community? Yeah, well, it's brilliant, actually. When I first started, I thought, you know, all, all these video competitors, you know, I wonder what they're doing and I would look at their websites and stuff. But because we're all so different, it doesn't really matter that there's other people, you know, around you that do what you do. And I've worked so many times with other videographers in the area and I've called upon other videographers when I can't do a project. And, you know, I think you should be supporting each other, you know, and I think if you help another videographer they're then going to help you you know it's kind of a, a two-way street and as I said I've been on loads of shoots working as a, as a camera assistant for other people and just because you know not everyone kind of understands that the world of videography so sometimes you just need another videographer to chat to just because you know you can relate and, and kind of talk about your problems and stuff that you're having so yeah it's really nice to kind of have that community built up but I, I very very rarely come across a, a female videographer so all of my video friends are guys but um so yeah, it'd be good to meet some some more female videographers <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to think of, of whether I know any other ones or not. I'll have a think and let you know if I do. Um, the ones that have come to mind immediately are, are male as well. I know lots of female photographers. but Yeah, it is, it is that way around. It, it's a very male-dominated industry. But that's, yeah, that's, that's not a problem at all. It's just, it's just interesting how that's kind of happened. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's great to be seeing them as supports because I, I, I think, again, that when you're starting out, that feeling that you had of, of their competitors is entirely natural. And, and it's hard when you're trying to make those, um, you know, those dents and to start, you know, getting some business to not feel threatened by them. So being able to see them as a support and, and recognizing the differences and how you can help each other is, um, is really valuable. Oh, definitely. I completely agree. And also it's being self-employed can be lonely, you know, so having other people to, to talk to, um, especially in your industry, is, is so beneficial. And I know so many videographers that have given me so much advice, you know, even though our ideal client might be the same or, or really similar, they're still so keen to help. And it just it makes your life so much easier being open to working with people rather than working against people. You know, you won't you won't get anything. And as I said earlier, chances are your ideal clients are going to be different anyway. So it, it pays to to connect with them, because if they get a, someone asking them for a video that's more to that's more your genre rather than theirs, you know, they, they're going to call on you to, to work with them. So it, it really is worthwhile making friends with them. Yeah, as you say, it can make a huge difference. And and that loneliness aspect is, I think, on most of the interviews that I've done so far for the podcast, that that comes up on a regular basis, that, you know, we all have this, this rose-colored view of working for yourself and the flexibility and the reality of how lonely it can be doesn't hit until you encounter it. So, so as you say, establishing that community is, is really important. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think networking helps um, with that look, kind of lonely aspect as well. And I, I think I would really struggle if I didn't go networking and meet other business owners. I think that, that's probably the best advice I can give to anyone starting up is just go out and meet people because, you know, like, it, it can be really lonely. But when you've got other people that you can meet who are in the same boat as you, it just makes it so much easier. And it, it's, I, I always think that the pros completely outweigh the cons of being self-employed obviously the con one of the cons are is being lonely so if you can eliminate that you know you're, you're sort of onto a winner yes exactly and and how are you finding being in a new area and you know needing to start networking with new people are you are you finding that exciting or scary or are you still really working with people from from around here 
Yeah, I mean, it helped that I've obviously moved networking groups from my group in Cambly and I moved straight to the one in Swindon. So already that was a, a good way of kind of meeting people in the area. And I think, although it is daunting, feeling like you've got to build up again, it's also really exciting because it's a whole new group of people. And funnily enough, my first ever client came from Swindon, so I do actually have a couple of connections here anyway. So, so that's handy. And I, yeah, I'm just really excited to meet more businesses. That's kind of funny, isn't it? That you followed your first ever client. <laughs> I don't know, it's, like it's come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Holly, I know that you are, I think, is it your first international job coming up? That's right, yeah. Tomorrow I fly to Malaga to film with a business coach, which is exciting. Very exciting. So is it somebody who is actually based in Malaga or is it somebody who you know more locally and that's where they want to do it? She's actually someone who runs my uh, the coaching program that I'm a part of now. It, it's her company. Um, and she just said, so she's got a few houses. She's got a couple in England, I think, and, and one in Malaga. And she just said, look, cause I'm paying monthly for this coaching. And she said, would you like, I don't know if you'll be interested in, instead of paying for it, just doing a skill swap. So I'll get the coaching um, in in return for doing some videos for them. And she just said, look, I, I don't have any time to film in England. I don't suppose you'd fancy us flying you out to Spain and, and working, you know, and I'm obviously not going to say no to that. So <laughs> I'm like, Oh, no, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I'm too busy to go somewhere warm and sunny and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, especially as Swindon's pretty grey and rainy right now, I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's really exciting as well to be starting to, you know, go further afield. Thank you. Yeah, and funnily enough, someone got in touch with me yesterday um, who wanted some, she's a yoga instructor and she wanted some videos filmed as well. And she happens to live in Malaga as well. So I don't know why I keep getting drawn back to that place. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Make the most of it. Maybe soon you'll have a second home in Malaga as well. <laughs> I hope so. That's the dream. <laughs> um, so uh, Holly, if we go just um, onto the personal side, I suppose, and, you know, a lot of the people I, I'm speaking to are people who have, you know, they're in their second or maybe their third career. Um, they've often, you know, got a family and they're trying to to balance their 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 personal life, you know, possibly their children and, and making, you know, big changes. So, so for them, I... I I guess I relate to, to the transitions and some of the challenges they're making, but you're at a much earlier stage and I know that you're um, living with your boyfriend and I think it was your hamster, your giant bunny. And was there one other thing living with you? And um, we've just adopted another hamster yesterday. So two hamsters, a rabbit and a boyfriend. <laughs> I noticed that the boyfriend is third. <laughs> Yeah, it's that hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you find keeping the balance, not just with, well, with your family, but also keeping the balance with maintaining a social life, with, you know, not working all of the time and, and just keeping your well-being at the fore of your thinking? It, it is really difficult, actually. And it's, it's one of the things that I've, I've definitely struggled with as a business owner. And I know loads of other people do because because it's your business, it's your baby. It's really hard to, to switch off. You know, you don't kind of come home at night and forget about it. It's always in the back of your mind. But for me, I created a default diary. So for every day um, of the working week, my hours are kind of divided on a spreadsheet. And I know that on a Monday between 10 and 11, I'm doing my Facebook marketing. And then from 11 to 12, I'm doing something else. So because it's all kind of mapped out for me, uh, it makes me much more productive. But it also means that once I've finished, I know that I've got everything done for the day and I can kind of switch off as, as much as you possibly can. Um, I, I think that's how people burn out. You know, they don't stop working and they just, they carry on and they carry on and carry on. And, and because for most people you set up because you love what you do and you're just going to fall out of love with it if you're working so hard so it is so so important to make sure you book holidays and you know work the hours that you want to work don't feel like you've got to work seven days a week you know 10 hours a day it's it's not about that it, it really is about finding the balance and making sure that you do allow time for you know for personal things because the last thing you want is to burn out and, and stop loving what you do love 
Uh, absolutely. And and do you find that your, you know, that scheduling, that making sure that you planned out what you're doing, um, has that evolved as, as you've been running the business or was it something that you put in place fairly early? For the first kind of year and a half, I'd never heard of the default diary and I was just kind of working as and when and I'd be working really, really late each night. So yeah, I mean, it, it has kind of developed and it, it probably will change every sort of few months, I imagine. But I'm starting to have my weekends back. You know, I've, I've not been working weekends for quite a long time now. And yeah, I mean, as the business kind of evolves, and as I start working with different people, it obviously means things have to shift around, you know, especially as I start to film more, more video courses rather than promos. They take up a lot more time. So it is just about reshuffling it, but it's, it's helped me massively. And I really recommend it to anyone who struggles with procrastination or struggles with, you know, staying focused. Cause like, I completely get it and it really does help. I know. I mean, you mentioned that you suffer from shiny object syndrome. <laughs> Massively, yeah. <laughs> so in your free time, do you find, you know, is is videoing what you like to do in your free time as well? Is it something that you you think, you know, yes, I get immense ple- immense pleasure out of this, or or do you have other hobbies and things which you 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 kind of step away from the camera? Yeah, I mean to be honest, I, I am still so passionate about filming and I love it, but it does it's, it kind of blurs the line. If I start doing it in my spare time as, as well, I know I'll end up just editing work for clients and stuff. So <laughs> I try and keep them as separate as, as I can, to be honest. But I mean, I'm I'm a musician. I play the drums and guitar and piano. So I really like to do that in my spare time. And it works quite well, actually, because all my music, I mean, my videos, sorry, often need a, a backing track. So being able to record my own music for it, you know, has, has obviously kind of helped me quite a lot. And it means that I can give people um, a completely bespoke video, you know, that's not, it's, it's completely for them and they're the only person, you know, in the world with that bit of music and stuff. So yeah, I guess all my hobbies kind of interlink with work and, and kind of personal time as well. Oh, and that's really nice because I know one of the challenges, you know, with videos and things is finding music and well, finding music, finding music that you like, finding music that you can legally use um, and is different, <laughs> isn't the same one that everybody else is using. So that's a really, uh, as you say, a neat tie-in to to bring it together with you enjoy doing it, but it's also adding to your business as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I see a lot of um, established video companies that use music that's been watermarked and you know they haven't paid for it and I think you you can get into so much trouble for it you know you are breaking the laws so it's so important to as you mentioned make sure it's copyright free and and being able to create your own music you know it just it means you'll you'll always be safe and you don't ever have the risk of it suddenly being taken down and you know although it's very unlikely you'll get caught it's just not worth the risk you know it's it's very serious and people do get caught out so if you are going to use music it's so important to make sure that you've got permission and that you know, you're not going to get sued for it. Well, and, and I would be, I'd be really annoyed if I'd paid somebody to do a video and they'd used music that, you know, neither they nor I had the legal right to use. Because again, that's, you know, if you're, if you're putting music on it, I'm expecting that it's something I've got the right for and the worry and the stress if it did get, you know, and, and with the algorithms and things, things get found a lot more quickly um i remember a while ago somebody was doing it was it was being done via facebook live and as part of their presentation they just wanted to play a snippet of a movie and they started playing the snippet of the movie um and facebook came up and stopped it so this algorithm was like instantaneous that it was hang on you're playing this movie it's on facebook live you can't do that stopped so yeah it, it's so clever it's so clever now technology and facebook are really hot on kind of um uh hearing music and or music from a film or, or just from the charts and they will take it down for you you can get in a lot of trouble for it and it's just it's just not worth the risk and like you say if you're paying money for a decent video the last thing you want to be worrying about is whether you can use it legally you know and it's i think some videographers think that it's one of those things that you know they won't get caught and because the laws are a little bit confusing with copyright and royalty free and I think the lines get blurred a bit so they probably don't mean to do it intentionally but you know it's it's not not right to do it and you know at the end of the day it's someone else's artwork that you're using you know it's it's not fair to, to not pay them the money for it so yeah I think it's really important 
Yeah, and I, and I agree completely. And th there was something that I did, which um, was using a little video tool. And I used one of their pieces of music, which, you know, was provided by them. And I think yeah, I think yeah. it was YouTube that came back and said to me that there was a claim against it. But they were um, the company that provided the software were obviously used to this. And they said, you know, all of our, our music is legal. Um, you are allowed to use it. All you need to do is respond with this. And then, you know, YouTube will look at it and then they'll realize that it's okay. Um, and if they don't, then talk to us. So it was a really, it was still that kind of worry of, are they going to take my video down? But it was a really um, clear process, which made it a lot easier because I, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. So Yeah, that, that's very reassuring. It, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, no, no, definitely. Sorry, go on. No, 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 it's okay, go ahead. Um, I think I was just going to say um, about YouTube. Yeah, I mean, obviously, once you've your video's on there, you've, you've kind of racked up loads of views and you're getting traction with it. The last thing you want is to have it taken down, you know, once you've worked so hard to kind of get it out there. And, and if you take down a video and then re-upload it, you're going to lose all your previous views and it's just not worth, you know, have, starting that whole process again. Yeah, exactly. And, and and it's also, as you say, ethically, you know, you want to make sure you're using things you've got a right to and whether you paid it for it um, or you've used something which is free for commercial use and, and all of that. But you, you don't want to take advantage. Um, and just the stress if you if you were getting caught would, I don't know, make life difficult, wouldn't it? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, so sorry I'm just thinking about where we because I, I know we've we've gone around a few things what about the the challenges of running a business if you know I think most business owners have highs and lows and you know there are good times and bad times um times of self-doubt or as we mentioned before loneliness have you you know been experiencing or experienced any of those and and how do you keep yourself going yeah, tons of times, you know, and I think no business owner has a completely um, straightforward line, you know, of progression. It's always massive highs and massive lows. And I, uh, the thing to remember is that it's not going to be every day it gets better and better and better. It's going to be some days are incredible, some days are okay, and some days are terrible, <laughs> you know, just because... <laughs> things go wrong it's one of those things that when when it starts going wrong and um, you're then put in a bad mindset and you know I'm a big believer in kind of laws of attraction I think if you're kind of down about things and you're worried about things you're just going to attract more worry so although it's really really difficult I think staying positive is is going to make all the difference and I believe it's made all the difference with me and for me I just if I'm having you know a bad day or battle things just kind of aren't going I'll just step away even if it's just for a few hours and you know listen to an audiobook from someone that's inspirational or or just kind of take some time out and just remember that all the times that it's gone horribly wrong is going to then go amazingly well again so it is just kind of staying grounded and I think also having other business people that you're close to that you can kind of chat to um, is always so helpful and having that support network of people that you can talk to you know it's always going to be helpful um, and for me it it, it really is just a case of, of staying positive and remembering that, you know, no, not every day is going to be amazing. There's always going to be hard times, but I still so strongly believe that all the pros massively outweigh the cons. So even when it is going badly, just, just remember why you do what you do and, and just kind of, yeah, bring it back to basics. And I, I just, I, I'm always really grateful for kind of where I am and the fact that I get to do what I love every single day. So just kind of um, remembering all of that really does help. And I also keep a, a journal of, of kind of gratitude journal. So every day you write down 10 things that you're, you're grateful for. And, you know, when things don't go right, if you look back through that journal, you start to kind of remember and you start to reconnect with why you set your business up. And, and for me, that makes all the difference. And, and that's really great advice. And I've so, so one of the things I found really interesting doing the these interviews is some of the similarities that are showing up between different entrepreneurs and the gratitude journal um, or, or something along those lines has started to show up so many times. And, and I think it's a really great idea it's because it, it's so easy to lose sight of those things and so easy to just focus on, on the moment. And, and if that current moment isn't great, 
then as you say, it brings you down. So being able to look back at those is a really, can be a really uplifting experience. Um, so I think it's great that you're doing them. And I, and I think it, it's, it's kind of great that so many people seem to be doing them now as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think also another good tip to help you, if you've got um, like a Facebook page with reviews on, or if people, if your clients have sent you reviews and they've, they've kind of recommended you, it's really nice to read back on them. And I think whenever I've been having a day where I've got self-doubt, I just go on my Facebook and have a look at what people have written. And it, it really does remind you, you know, that, if you stop doing what you're doing, you're not able to help other people, you know, and people need your help, whatever business you, you run, you will be helping people. It doesn't matter what industry it's in. So for me, I know that other businesses who need help with their video marketing aren't going to get that if I stop doing what I do. So that's also a really good kind of way of, of helping you to, to stop being, you know, like, like things are going tits up and, and start kind of, you know, remembering all the good times kind of reminds you that it's not all about you it's like no I'm doing this and it's helping other people yeah exactly that <laughs> and Holly as I, I think I mentioned at the beginning and, and when I spoke to you initially I think I think it's really inspirational how you started up your business and how you you've made the progress you have and where you've got to so far is there any advice that you would give to other people, whether they're students who are currently in university, whether they're people who, you know, haven't gone to university and are looking for what they're doing, or equally somebody who's thinking about leaving their job, that they're working, you know, somewhere that isn't giving them satisfaction. Anything you'd like to, to share or advise them on? Yeah, well, I think honestly, you, you only get one life, you get one shot and you have to live to your full potential. You know, I know it sounds so cheesy and deep, but I really do believe that, you know, and so many people are spending their working life not enjoying it. And that's five out of seven days. You know, think how many years you're going to waste not enjoying it. And I think for me, what, what really helped me to make the decision was knowing that it's been done before. You know, that what, whatever you want to do has been done before. There's, there's millions of business owners doing what you want to do right now. So you know that it's possible because, you know, other people exist. So I'm a really big believer in jumping and, and the net will, will kind of appear. So, you know, I always think that the life that you want to lead is, is kind of outside of your comfort zone. So, you know, no one ever lived out their dreams sat in their comfort zone. So if it's something you want to do, just, just go for it because nothing's really permanent. You know, if you say you decided to kind of set up your own business bench or whatever that, whatever your dream may be, if it doesn't work out, you know, it's not, not the end of the world. Just go back to doing what you were doing before. So you haven't really got anything to lose. And I, I know that's easier said than done for a lot of people. And obviously for me, I, I didn't, I didn't have a family or I didn't have a big career. So maybe it was an easier jump, but I still think that, you know, you've got to do what, whatever makes you happy. And, and, you know, you've got, like I say, you've only got one shot. So you may as well kind of live life to your fullest potential and, and just go for it. That's really wonderful, Holly. And I can just hear the enthusiasm in your voice as you're saying that as well. And, and I think you're right. It, it can be hard to make the leap, but if you don't make it, you'll never know what would have happened and you'll never know if it would have worked. Um, and if it doesn't work, then your life will go somewhere else and, and, and it will still take you, you know, I believe it will still take you ultimately somewhere positive. Oh, I completely agree with you. And, you know, my, my worst fear is kind of being on my deathbed and thinking, I wish I'd done more of that. You know, no one ever regrets trying to follow their dreams and do what they want. So, <laughs> you know, I just think it's that. <laughs> I always remember somebody saying to me I wasn't I was feeling really ill and I kept going into work um, this was one of the contracts I was working on quite a long time ago now actually and my manager at the time said go home go away I think I'd started taking some new medication which was making me feel really horrible and she said go away and I do mean you know go away for a few days she said because nobody's going to admire you if on your gravestone it says you know Deborah worked really hard <laughs> and, and it was so true I love that. exactly <laughs> it's like is that what you want your gravestone to say and it's like well no actually you're kind of right maybe I don't <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly you know you've got 
you've got to be selfish and you've got to put yourself forward and it doesn't I don't think it matters where you are in your life I've met so many people that you know in their 60s some of them in their 70s that have recently set up a business you know it's incredible and it's just you know you've got to do what you were meant to do and, and like you said earlier if it doesn't work out you know it will lead you to somewhere else anyway so I do think you've just got to kind of keep the faith and and yeah do whatever it was you were supposed to do. That is really wonderful, Holly, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk. I've really enjoyed it. And is there thank anything you. you want to say as we wrap up? Just thanks for having me, really. And it would be really great to kind of meet other um, sort of young entrepreneurs that have maybe come out of, of university or come out of college. You know, it's, it's always great to meet other people and just I try and do a bit of public speaking with colleges and, and just to kind of show people that, you know, that they're you don't have to get a job if that's not right for you. So, so really, I guess it's just a case of, um, yeah, telling other young people that it is possible and not even necessarily young people, just anyone who wants to do, you know, run their own business, that it's totally doable. And um, yeah, I hopefully look forward to meeting a few people in a similar boat to me and, and carry on working with um, other business owners, creating videos for them as well. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Holly. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Deborah Levitt on Bridging Gaps, the business podcast. 